Okay, um, welcome back everyone. Thanks for uh, coming again. Um, so the, the plan today will be to first uh, finish up some of the discussion about extremal problems for regular graphs. Um, I'm gonna start from this identity that we, we proved last time and then uh, show you how two theorems derive from that. But uh, I'm, I'm really just delving into the surface of that topic. There's more in the lecture notes, but then uh, as I said, you can look at the UFA's uh, survey and then uh, papers mentioned there, uh, all sorts of nice things to go on. Uh, but the main topic today will be um, expansion methods. And so I'm gonna introduce something called the, the cluster expansion. Uh, and um, this uh, will carry us into the next lecture, which will be about applying the cluster expansion uh, at low temperatures, um, which I, you know somehow I think of as the, the maybe the the most exciting topic of these lectures. So uh, we're definitely going to spend some time on it. And you know the the fifth lecture probably will be uh, mostly that, and then uh, I'll touch on the sphere packings and so on at the very end. Um, very good. So um, right. So we'll finish this discussion of extremal problems for regular graphs. We'll introduce something called the cluster expansion. Uh, and talk about convergence, um, convergence criteria and consequences for combinatorial enumeration. Um, let me just say that uh, today, following the lectures, I'll, I'll be around on Zoom for office hours if you wanna stop by and ask more detailed questions. Uh, I posted the link in the chat, but I'll also post uh, the link again at the end. Um, great, so that's the plan. Uh, so let's start, and, and again, you know, feel free to ask questions in the chat. I have the chat open. Um, but let's, let's start from uh, where we left off last time and recall. So we have uh, G is a deregular graph, irregular, let's say, triangle-free graph. Uh, we define the occupancy fraction, which we're calling alpha bar G of lambda which is one over n expected size of the random independent set drawn from the hardcore model um, at frugacity lambda. And what we, what we said last time was this, this is related to the logarithmic derivative of the partition function. So in particular, uh, if, you, if you calculate this, you can obtain the uh, number of independent sets in a graph, the partition function. If you let, this, if you let lambda tend to infinity, you get the independence ratio of the graph. Uh, so this, this one quantity contains a lot of information. Uh, and then we, we prove the following identity. And so the identity was um, alpha g bar of lambda equals um, 1 over d lambda over 1 plus lambda expectation of this random variable y, which I'll recall in a second, um, which also equals lambda over one plus lambda expectation of one plus lambda to the minus y. And here y is the uh, number of uncovered neighbors of a vertex V when we pick V uniformly and I according to the hardcore model. Okay, and we prove this identity by using this, uh, these spatial independence properties of Markov random fields or Gibbs measures. Uh, and somehow this is the key identity for us. Uh, it not only tells you a formula in terms of this random variable Y for the occupancy fraction, but there's two formulas. And so what we're gonna think of, we're gonna think of these two formulas, this equality here as a constraint. Okay, it's, it's an equality that's satisfied for all deregular triangle free graphs. Uh, and it constrains this random variable y. Uh, and y also has some other constraints, of course. So, uh, you know, so y, is uh, it's between zero and D, right? Since it's the number of neighbors of a certain type uh, and it's a deregular graph and it satisfies uh, 
1 over d expectation y equals expectation 1 plus lambda to the minus y. OK, so uh, and we want to understand this. And we want to understand how big can the occupancy fraction be, how small can the occupancy fraction be, and so on as a function of d and lambda. Uh, and so the idea is just to relax the problem. So relax here has a, a certain meaning in optimization. Um, what it means is that you uh, enlarge the set of possible optimizers. And so really, you know, what, you know, what optimization problem are we interested in? We're interested in, you know, originally, we want to maximize or minimize, maximize alpha g bar of lambda over d regular graphs g. Okay, so this is this is our original optimization problem. It's a little bit uh, it's a little bit hard to get your head around because you you're the set of possible solutions are all possible d regular graphs, which is a sort of strange set of um, of possible solutions. But the relaxation is the following: maximize, let's say, uh, expectation of y over all random variables y satisfying um, zero is less than y is less than d and expectation of one over d expectation y equals expectation one plus lambda to the minus y. Okay, so, so we've just, we've enlarged our possible set of uh, solutions, and now we're just talking about uh, random variables, distributions. Uh, I mean, we could have we could have been even uh, we could have added more constraints that y is integer valued, but um, but we don't need to do that. Uh, this is our new optimization problem. Okay, so it's a it's a new optimization problem, and now it's just an optimization problem on. Um, on random variables and, and you could you could make this into like a finite optimization problem by saying well there's probably it's zero probably it's one and so on um, but if you look at this constraint right you have a linear function and you have a convex function and uh, since I don't I don't want to take too much time today on this topic I'll sort of jump to the punchlines here but if you want to maximize the ex expectation of a, random, uh, of a random variable that's bounded between 0 and d, subject to the expectation equals the expectation of a convex function, uh, then you want to, to maximize. You want to put all the probability mass on the two extremes. Zero and d. Okay, so th that's the solution. The solution is, you know, y takes the value zero with some p zero and d with some probably p d. And there's a unique such feasible random variable. Because we have to satisfy, satisfy the constraint. Okay, so it's just convexity that tells you this. Um, and then, then we actually have a graph theory result because um, let's imagine our graph, right? So uh, remember our target was this complete deregular bipartite graph. And let's say, you know, all vertices look the same. Here's V and we wanna look at how many of its neighbors are uncovered. Okay, so there's two possibilities if a vertex on V's side is occupied, occupied, if any of these vertices are occupied, then all of these, the vertices on the right, are covered, and Y equals zero. On the other hand, 
if no one here is occupied, then all are uncovered. And so this very particular distribution is achieved by a graph, by one graph. Okay, and that's the proof. So the theorem here would be um, for all deregular triangle free apps G, the occupancy fraction is at most that of the complete deregular bipartite graph. And so this is uh, this is a joint theorem with Green Davies, Matthew Jensen, Barnaby Roberts. Okay, so that and you know, uh, in the notes I show you how to take away the triangle-free case, the triangle-free condition, uh, and the idea is instead of looking at a random variable that counts the number of uncovered neighbors, you want to look at the a graph induced by your uncovered neighbors. In the triangle free case, it's just y uncovered vertices, uh, isolated vertices, but there might be edges. And so the, the, uh, the distribution becomes more complicated, but you can do the same thing. Um, and, you know, and by integrating, this strengthens the theorem that we mentioned before. So this is a uh, strengthening of the theorem of and Zhao and Galvin and Tuttle. Okay, so that's that's one result. Um, and uh, just just by looking at this identity, relaxing the optimization problem from graphs to distributions, um, and then and then maximizing. Um, of course, we don't have to maximize, right? We can minimize. Okay, again, subject to um, uh, 1 over d expectation of y equals 1 plus lambda, ex expectation of 1 plus lambda to the minus y. Okay, so if, if um, when you maximize subject to this convex constraint, you want to put the mass on the extremes. When you minimize, what do you want to do? So relax again, relax to distributions and minimize. So the minimizer, or, you know, you can see this just by Jensen's inequality, but, but the minimizer is uh, the constant random variable. So y equals little y, where 1 over dy equals 1 plus lambda to the minus y. So if you want to minimize uh, the expectation of y subject to this constraint, you actually want to make y a constant. Okay, uh, and so so this gives you some uh, lower bound, lower bound on alpha bar g of lambda for all uh, triangle-free uh, deregular graphs. Okay, and then if you if you want to look in the notes, uh, see, I'll I'll show I'll show you here. Um, I, I sort of plot what this lower bound looks like. Um, yeah, so here this is a d is one hundred, uh, and this is a plot of the lower bound. Uh, the lower bound you get it, it's a it's a it's a little bit uh, puzzling. The lower bound you get is not monotone. Uh, it peaks at some point even though you know that the, um, the truth, the occupancy fraction itself is monotone increasing. And so really the lower bound you get out looks like this. You, uh, you, know, you, you have this lower bound and then you, this remains a lower bound uh, there. Okay, and then I, I work through uh, some, somehow the asymptotics of what this bound gives, but let me, let me state the theorem that you get out. 
and this is this is a theorem that hopefully will interest you in, as a combinatorics person. So theorem, um, this is also with uh, uh, Davies, Jensen, and Roberts. So um, for all um, d regular or max degree d triangle free graphs. The average size of the independent set, let's just put lambda equals one, is at least one plus little o one as d goes to infinity log d over d. Okay, and uh, and this is tight. Uh, the constant one. And we can look at the right of the random regular graph conditioned on it being triangle free. Okay, the, the interesting thing to compare it to is compared to Shearer's theorem. Okay, and Shearer's theorem is uh, for all average degree D graphs, uh, D average degree D triangle free graphs. the independence number divided by n is at least one plus little one with d log d over d. Okay, so same constant one. Um, the, the difference is that we need max degree and we get the average size of an independent set. He, needs, uh, he just needs average degree, which is weaker, but only gets a, a lower bound on the maximum size of an independent set. Um, and but the, what's interesting about Shearer's theorem is this implies the Ramsey, the, uh, Ramsey number upper bound. So this implies R3K is at most K squared over log K. Okay, and you can also deduce this bound from, from our result, but what I wanna mention, and I've, you know, maybe some of you have heard me mention this before, but I wanna mention it, I think this is a nice open problem. Uh, can you use the average uh, result? So the, say the occupancy fraction result uh, to improve the upper bound on R3K. In particular, so, okay, that's a question, I guess. The conjecture is that, uh, for instance, for all triangle-free graphs uh, G, let's say alpha of G over N, the independence ratio is at least uh, four-thirds times the occupancy fraction at one. Okay, so I, 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 we conjectured that there's some um, structural reason that when you're triangle free, uh, there really has to be a gap between the size of your, the average size of an independent set and the largest size of an independent set. Okay, and in the notes, I, I give like maybe four different forms of this conjecture, um, you know, some with minimum degree D, uh, some without, um, but there's a bunch of different conjectures and any of these sort of structural results you could prove about the uh, independent sets, uh, maximum versus average in triangle free graphs uh, would lead to some improvement in this uh, bound on R3K. And currently the gap between upper and lower bound for R3K is a factor of four. And there's, there's somehow a potential to gain a factor two from Shearer's upper bound because uh, while this average result here, we said this, this one is tight, the random deregular graph, uh, Shearer's result is not tight. There's you know, a potential factor of two to be gained because the largest independent set in the random deregular graph is twice log D over D. And so uh, you know, I, I think it would be great if, if someone's able to figure out how to leverage this average independent set size result to, to gain that factor two in Shearer's bound. Okay, so let me ask any questions about this topic. Uh, I can also point you in the lecture notes. I added some uh, exercises 
Um, and some of these exercises lead to open problems. So, uh, you know, as you go through, uh, you know, you can, you can learn some stuff, but you can also maybe solve, solve a new problem. Can I ask a stupid one? Okay, great. Yeah, so any questions here before I move on to chapter three or lecture three? May I ask a stupid question? Oh, I didn't quite hear that. Can you say that again? May I ask a, a stupid one? Oh, yeah. I'm still way back uh, in theorem 2.8 where we are trying to prove that KDD maximizes the op occupancy fraction. Yeah. And even in the easy case where there's no triangles. Yeah. So um, initially, we're trying to optimize over all kinds of deregular graphs, right? But yeah. because we can use the the identity and then suddenly we we can only uh, we can do it by maximizing y but it seems that y so to each graph there is a y but why yeah. why isn't optimizing this over all y to to a fixed graph tells us something about the occupancy fraction over all graphs yeah, so great question. This is the idea of relaxation. So we are we're maximizing the expectation of y subject to some constraint. And as you said, every graph yields a distribution y. Yes. And so certainly the maximum over all uh, over all distributions y is at least the maximum over all graphs. Okay, can you say that again? The maximum over all random variables y, not coming from, not necessarily coming from graphs. The maximum oh. has to be at least the maximum when you just restrict to graph distributions. Oh yes, and that is achieved by some graph, which is exactly KDD. yeah. So to each graph, there is exactly one y, and we're, we we just look at y. Yeah. Oh. For every graph, there's a y, nice. and we just showed, you know. Uh, if you don't even constrain to graph distributions, the maximum is achieved by a certain graph. And so this must be the maximizer over graphs. That's very neat. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Well, I also have uh, yeah. uh, uh, one email. Ask, uh, okay. uh, I wanted to ask, uh, can you prove that uh, KDD maximizes the number of independent sets uh, over all graphs using these arguments? Yes, you mean the the number? Yeah, the number of independent sets. Yeah, yeah you can. Yeah. So this is this is the extension I mentioned, uh, and it's in the lecture notes when you when you get rid of the triangle free assumption. Ah, okay, is, thank you. Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah, without triangle free assumption. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I also have uh, two questions. So first, uh, about the streak with uh, y. So mm -hmm. is it? Uh, did it appear anywhere or like did, did the statistic, statistical physics people uh, have it did you or did you come up uh, with it uh, from a just graph theory perspective because it looks like a very graph theoretic tool I was just wondering if it's uh, yeah so actually I mean actually if you look at alone and Spencer there is a proof almost like this um, but there they don't use the, the lambda um, and they don't use a lambda yeah. and they don't they don't set set it as a constraint um and somehow optimize over this constraint but the idea there is you pick a, a, a uniformly random independent set and you you can measure uh somehow the the size in two ways um so it's it certainly has appeared before i think even so Shearer actually even knew a proof like this that he had in some lecture notes that he sent me uh, when when we we contacted him about this. So certainly the idea was known. Um, uh, I think what was not known in combinatorics was that you could once you have this, you could integrate this and use this to get like lower bounds on the number of independent sets in triangle free graphs, for example. Um, but certainly this idea here is. is mm -hmm. not, um, yeah. Okay, but uh, does it uh, does this trick have some? kind of statistical natural statistical physics interpretation or not really um i mean certainly the quantity has a very natural yeah. interpretation but i don't know about like for them for them they always are thinking of just one graph and so it doesn't quite uh make it doesn't it's not quite in their perspective to think optimizing over graphs 
but I, I was more thinking about this passing to the neighbors and then uh, ah, okay well uh, yeah so i should say that there is a, a pretty related thing which is like this idea of the belief propagation algorithm um which is usually used for like locally tree-like graphs or random graphs and there this this idea really is the case you look at the, the marginal distributions of your neighbors and make some assumption about their correlations and try to compute the marginal of the root vertex okay and so this is quite similar okay yeah. and the other question uh, so this four thirds which graph does it come from this comes from like okay it, it's not exactly four thirds but it's some uh, it's a number that's uh close to a little bit bigger than four thirds but it's like it's a Ramsey graph, so it's like the Ramsey graph that achieves R three nine or something. Oh, okay. Uh, so it, it's related to the Ramsey problem, in fact. I, we, in, in our paper, we we write something about it, and you know, uh, we give some other examples. But that's the that's the worst example we could find. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, okay. So let let's move on to to lecture three or chapter three, and um, the topic now is expansion methods. And uh, I'm pretty excited to tell you about this um, because I think uh, you may very well find it, it useful in some problem you're interested in. Um, and so let me first just give you a, a brief overview from the statistical physics side. Um, from the statistical physics side, you know, this dates back you know, at least 80 years. And what they were interested in is knowing there's something called an ideal gas, and an ideal gas is a, a, a gas of particles that don't interact. And it's very easy to calculate things about the ideal gas and, uh, and so on. You can understand it exactly. Um, but then what if you take a gas that has interactions, but the interactions are very weak, or the, the density of the gas is very low? You would hope that whatever you uh, understood about the ideal gas could somehow be transferred to understanding this non-ideal gas, the interacting gas. And um, the cluster expansion, or the Meyer expansion, is exactly an attempt to do this. It's, the idea is to um, write the logarithm of a partition function as an infinite series where uh, terms uh, measure interactions or, you know, in other words, deviations from the ideal guess. Okay, and so this was, uh, and how is it used in statistical physics? The idea is this is used uh, to um, prove absence of a phase transition. Or to write down series expansions uh, for observables. So like the infinite volume pressure, the density, these physically relevant quantities that you might want to know, uh, they use this thing, the cluster expansion, to write down some infinite series, infinite convergent series, uh, that tells you the pressure or the density or so on. And when the cluster expansion works, it also proves that there's no phase transition in a certain regime. And this, the regime is when you are close, in some sense, to the ideal gas. Um, and so what we want to do uh, in the next couple of lectures is to use the cluster expansion to enumerate things in combinatorics. Because as we said, z, this partition function, is a weighted counting object. And so if you can write down logarithm of z as an infinite series, you can write down, you know, you have your counting problem phrased as some infinite series, and maybe this is useful. Um, I, I will say that uh, the cluster expansion has been studied a lot in combinatorics. So cluster expansion in combinatorics. The, the paper to look at is the paper of Scott and Sokol. Uh, and it's all about 
uh, convergence criteria, which we'll get to. And, but more importantly, uh, the connection to the Lovas local lemma. And so, and th this is a fantastic uh, paper. I think it's like a hundred pages, but you can, you can so think of it almost like a textbook or lecture notes. You can go back and back to this uh, paper about the cluster expansion. And uh, it's a really interesting connection with the Lovas local lemma. This uh, really important tool of combinatorics is so closely related to this fundamental tool in statistical physics. Um, but what's not in this Scott and Sokol paper is, uh, any use of the cluster expansion to enumerate, to count things in combinatorics. And so hopefully that's what I'll convince you uh, you can uh, do uh, in the next couple lectures. Okay, so, so good. So that's somehow the, uh, oh good, someone asked a nice question. Isn't it also sometimes called the virial expansion in the literature? There's another series, uh, the virial expansion is another series. It's an expansion uh, so we'll see, this, this will be an expansion of the pressure or the log partition function in the fugacity, this lambda parameter. The virial expansion is a, an expansion in the density parameter. Uh, so there's, there, are, there are two different uh, infinite series, both of which are uh, quite interesting. Uh, good question. Okay, so the setting, and this, this is actually will be the natural setting, will be a multivariate hardcore model. So we have a graph G and each vertex V gets its own activity or fugacity lambda V. Okay, and, and we'll, we'll see that this is not just uh, generalizing for the sake of generalizing. This will be uh, really essential for the uses that we have in mind. Uh, and so what's the partition function here? So ZG now lambda is a vector. It's the sum over all independent sets, product over the vertices in the independent set, lambda B. Okay, so this is our multivariate uh, hardcore partition function. and um, Okay, you, of course you, you, you recover the previous partition function just plugging in the constant function lambda v equals lambda for all lambda. Uh, but now we, have, now we have this is a multilinear polynomial. And so I can tell you what the cluster expansion is in just a couple words. The cluster expansion it's the multivariate Taylor series for log CG of lambda and the variables lambda V uh, around zero. Okay, so this is all the this is all the cluster expansion is. Um, it's a multivariate Taylor series for a log partition function around zero. Okay, so, but, uh, you know, that's, that's just words. The nice thing is, nice thing, the terms um, have a very useful combinatorial description. in terms of connected objects that we'll call uh, clusters. Okay, and so what I, what I wanna show next is, uh, you know, what actually are the different terms in this multivariate uh, Taylor series? Um, I'm not gonna actually derive uh, this combinatorial representation for you. I've, I, in the notes, I've put some uh, pointers to literature where uh, these things are derived, um, but I, I just wanna give you an idea of what this cluster expansion is. Um, okay, so first we need to define what a cluster is. A cluster. Uh, so now we're fixing our graph G. It has all these vertices with uh, parameters, fugacities, lambda V. A cluster is a uh, tuple of vertices 
from G, whose uh, induced graph is connected. Okay, and the size, let's say the size of a cluster gamma is the length of the tuple. Length of the tuple. Okay, so I, I just want to give you an, a little example. So here's G, and maybe V1, V2, V3, V4. And so what are some examples of clusters? So one cluster, a cluster could just be a single vertex, so V1. A cluster could be multiple copies of the same vertex. Okay, so V1 three times would be a cluster. I'm, I'm thinking of the induced graph there as just being the single, the single vertex, and so it's connected. Uh, another cluster might be, I don't know, V2, V1, V2. Again, this is a connected object. Or you could say, I don't know, V1, V2, V3. That's another cluster. What's not a cluster, a, a, something that's not a cluster is like V3, V1, V1. Not a cluster. Right, because V1 and V3 are not joined. OK, so these are clusters. The next uh, combinatorial quantity Can you ask need. a small question regarding yeah. the definition? Yeah. Uh, does it make much sense to uh, drag along the information about the multiplicity of the AG? I, it seems like because they, they are not distinguished in the original graph, uh, we could just simply replace it with some combinatorial coefficient, no? Yes. Like, I, a cube, I mean... Uh, yes. It does. It, it seems to me that there is no much sense in in like distinguishing, t like making those lists tuples rather than sets. Because what's the point in duplicating the vertices several times? Other than I, the I completely agree that like, you can do this. Um, what you'll see is that somehow we really care about the length of the tuple because eventually we want to truncate a series to get an approximation. And so, so that's, it's actually going to be important to somehow distinguish, like separate when something appears once and when it appears 10 times. Uh, OK, thanks. Yeah, but it's, it's a very good point. OK, so the next, the next object is the Ursel function of a graph. Let's say h is. And this is, this is going to be a scaled evaluation of a tut polynomial. So uh, phi of h. So I'm going to scale it by the number of vertices factorial. And then I'm going to sum over all edge subsets so that uh, these edge subsets are spanning and connected. And I want to say minus 1 to the size of a. Okay, so this is, you know, this is just some combinatorial um, parameter of a graph. Uh, and then what graphs are we going to be looking at? We're going to be looking at uh, the graph H of a gamma, a cluster, is the graph with vertex set gamma. So the, the vertices that appear in the cluster are the vertices of this uh, graph, and here with multiplicity. So if, if V1 appears three times, there's three vertices in H. And um, UV is an edge in H of gamma, which would be expectation. If, uh, let's say, the distance of u and v uh, is less than uh, 1 in g. OK, so I'm saying distance of u and v in one is less than or equal to 1 because I'm, I want to put an edge 
in this graph H if U and V are neighbors in G, but also if they're the same vertex. Okay, so, so let's just see a couple examples. So let's say gamma, again, let's stick with this four cycle. So let's say gamma is um, V1, 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 then H of gamma is clique. Right, because we put an edge between vertices that are identical in the graph. If we have gamma is, I don't know, V3, V1, V2, then H of gamma is a V. Because both uh, V1 and V3 are joined to V2, but V3 and V2 are not joined. Okay, so, so this is just putting a graph structure on clusters. Okay, good. And so with these definitions, now we can define the cluster expansion. Uh, could you please yeah. hold on for a second? I've got a small question, probably yeah, yeah. a stupid one. Could you please um, like explain to me what you call a sum over all spanning connected uh, subsets of edges? Yeah, I mean, so what I mean by that is... Spanning is just, uh, just, just not quite familiar for me. Yeah, so what I mean by that is that uh, the graph um, V of H comma A is connected. So if, if you look at all the vertices of H and just the edges that are part of A, this graph should be a connected graph. So spanning, I just okay. mean there's no isolated vertices in this graph. The okay, edges should, yeah, the edges should touch all the vertices. Does that make sense? Yes, thanks. Okay, great. Um, okay, so what's the cluster expansion? It's the formal power series. Uh, log Z, G of this vector lambda is the sum over all clusters. Um, the Earth cell function of the cluster graph times the product over the vertices in the cluster with multiplicity lambda v. So this is an infinite power series. And, and these variables. Okay, it's infinite yeah, even though g is a finite graph because you can have multiple copies uh, you can have arbitrarily many copies of the same vertex uh, appearing in a cluster. Um, good. So, so one example, let's say G is just a, a single vertex V and with frugosity lambda. And clusters are just uh, K tuples or K copies of V. And uh, H, let's say that gamma K is K copies of V. H of gamma K is the clique on K vertices. So I'll tell you what the Ursel function of the clique is. The Ursel function of the clique is minus one to the K plus one uh, over K. Okay, so you can... Well, the, the, there is a question in the chat. For that. Okay. Do you include isomorphic subgraphs in counting of your function? So which function? The Ursel function? Oh. It's all possible edge <laughs> subsets. So you count them twice. If there's there are two isomorphic subgraphs in this Ursel function, then you count it twice. Oh, okay, okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's really over subsets of edges. Um, Okay, good. And so here's the, the Ursel function for the clique. And so what does that say? That says that log z is some k greater than or equal to 1, minus 1 to the k plus 1, lambda to the k over k. Okay, but of course, this is just, this is just the power series, the Taylor series. or uh, log of one plus z, one plus lambda, as we would like. 
Um, but just, you know, just to show you that it really is a Taylor series um, and it, it's what you would expect. Okay, but uh, if we want to use this, we need it to converge. Okay, so this is an infinite uh, infinite series, and if we if we want it to be useful for enumeration or for anything, we want this infinite series to converge, and we actually want it to converge kind of quickly, or at least we want to we want to be able to control the rate of convergence. Okay, and so there's a whole uh, branch of statistical physics interested in convergence criteria, um, and um, I give two different convergence criteria in the notes. One is from statistical physics, uh, uh, the Kotetsky price condition, uh, which we'll all state now. The other is uh, another result of Shearer that gave optimal conditions for convergence for a delta regular graph with a uniform activity. Uh, and this is very closely related to Lovas local lemma. But you can, you can read that in the notes, but also in the Scott Sokol stuff. Um, and so I'll, I'll just state the, the Kotetsky price convergence criteria. OK, so uh, here's the criteria. Um, it's a theorem. Oh, uh, good question. Is the proof for the cluster expansion elementary? Yes, it's elementary that this is the right formal power series. There's a trick. You replace like one and zero in the interaction by like uh, one plus or one minus one and zero. Convergence is not trivial though. So what we're about to say is uh, when does it converge? And this is, this is not trivial and it took quite a long time in statistical physics to come up with a rigorous proof of convergence. And it involved a bunch of combinatorics. Um, so there's a great history there. Uh, good, but here's, here's the Kotetsky price condition. So uh, we have a graph G, uh, fugacities, uh, and I'll say possibly complex numbers. So there's a whole reason you might be interested in complex variables, lambda V. Um, and uh, suppose there exist functions a of v, b of v, both positive, so that, let's say b is non-negative, so that the following holds. So for all vertices in the graph, you want the following. If we sum over u in the neighborhood of v union v, uh, absolute value of lambda u e to the a of u plus b of u. This should be at most a of u. Okay, so this is the Kotetsky price condition. Um, oh, good. Mohan asked a good, good, good question. Is the Ursel function computationally intractable? Uh, you can compute it in vertex exponential time. So it's an evaluation of the top polynomial. Um, but uh, you can't, I don't, there's no known algorithm to compute it in polynomial time, but you can do it in exponential time. Um, good question. Okay, so here we have this condition. And what is this condition saying roughly? It says roughly that the lambdas are small, right? The smaller the lambdas are uh, in, in complex absolute value, the easier it is to satisfy this condition. And so this is some rough smallness condition on lambdas. And of course, it also depends on, let's say, the degree of your graph. Uh, because it becomes harder to satisfy the more things you're summing over, the more use you're summing over. But the conclusion, uh, there's a, a bunch of great conclusions. And I'll sort of go A of V, first. right? So say it again. A of V at the end. Uh, A of V, thank you very much. A of V, yeah. Um, okay, so I'm going to state four conclusions, and they sort of go in reverse order. Uh, the, the fourth implies the third, implies the second, implies the first. Um, but the, they go, I'll, make, I'll state them in simplest order. So the first conclusion is that uh, your partition function is not zero. 
of course, if your partition function is zero, then this cluster expansion has no chance of converging. You're taking logarithm of zero. Um, so that's one conclusion. And this, this is how this has been used in combinatorics before, in fact. Um, second is the cluster expansion converges. Absolutely. Third is that you actually have a bound, uh, a tail bound. Um, and so let's say let B of gamma be the sum over V and gamma B of V. So B is this auxiliary function uh, in the condition. Um, then for T at least zero, if we sum over all clusters, so that B of gamma is at least T. So now I'm summing over only over a subset of clusters in my cluster expansion, and I'm taking the absolute value of the terms. This, there's a, a bound. So this is at most E to the minus T, uh, sum over V, A of V. So th this is this will be quite useful if you want to truncate your Taylor series or truncate your cluster expansion. So this allows uh, truncation of the cluster expansion with uh, explicit error bounds. So somehow by only summing over clusters where B is large, we're throwing away uh, large clusters but we have a nice bound on uh, the absolute value of what we're throwing away. Okay, and it's exponentially de decreasing in T. Uh, so that's nice. And then fourth, uh, this is, uh, we'll, we'll use this uh, append bound. And so you can actually look more locally. Uh, you can say sum over all clusters containing a, a given vertex V of a certain size, and then the same absolute value is at most e to the minus t a of v. Okay, and so it's pretty clear uh, going back uh, in reverse order why four implies three, implies two, implies one, um, but uh, we will use all of these at various points. Um, okay, so any questions about this condition and the conclusions? Just uh, at a very high level, we're saying if the lambdas are small enough as a function of the degree of the graph and the way they interact, then the cluster expansion converges. And if they're even a little bit smaller, you get this nice exponential decay of the terms of the cluster expansion. Can you say a little bit about the proof? This uh, Yeah, the proof, the proof is, uh, you can look at the original paper, it's inductive uh, and it's a bit mysterious. Um, there's, there's lots and lots of different proofs of cluster expansion convergence. Uh, often they involve uh, counting trees uh, and combinatorial things. This proof is very uh, inductive, but a little mysterious. Um, but there's been, there's lots and lots of other proofs uh, of it, but usually it's inductive. Uh, so I have a question. Mm -hmm. so I'm sorry, like are these conditions for absolute convergence? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, so uh, the criteria two is absolute convergence. Oh, sorry, the conclusion two. Will, when, when you said about the point one that it was used in combinatorics, so first, first just to make sure some lambdas would be negative or even complex. In, in complex, this yeah. And uh, what, I mean, maybe you'll give an example later, but if not, what would be a, an example of a statement that you so, would use um, one for? There's a paper by Sokol and then a paper by Borgs. Uh, and the, the conclusion is that the chromatic polynomial of a max degree delta graph uh, has no zeros, uh, I have to remember, it, either inside or outside a certain disk. Um, and so, so somehow the, it was used when the, the statement you wanted to prove is actually about zeros of graph polynomials in the complex plane. Okay. 
Um, good. So uh, we don't have so much time, but let me let me just uh, give you a little bit of a guide to the lecture notes. That's probably the most useful thing I can do now. Um, let's see. So um, so this is the cluster expansion. Um, I, I talked a little bit about the connection with the Lovas local lemma, but you can you can read that. Um, probably the important thing to go over or to, to read uh, before next time, and we'll, we'll start with this, is uh, some of the consequences of convergence. So of course, one consequence of convergence is that you get a series representation for log z, and you can truncate it with uh, guaranteed error bounds. Um, but there's other consequences, because if you recall from our discussion from the first lecture, you can express the moments or the cumulants of uh, the size of the independent set or other uh, observables in terms of derivatives of the log partition function, uh, the great thing is you can actually differentiate the, you can differentiate the cluster expansion if it converges. And so you can get, uh, so here, for instance, we have an expression for uh, the mean size of an independent set as a cluster expansion. Okay, And then you can do the same, and this, this I find kind of remarkable, if you, if you add some auxiliary variables like we did before to each vertex, uh, then if you take partial derivatives of the cluster expansion, you can express um, the truncated correlation functions in terms of new cluster expansions. Okay, and so then the lemma uh, that I wanted to show, uh, but it's in the notes, is that if the Katetsky price condition holds with some positive uh, a and B, and let's say it's constant for all uh, vertices, then we have exponential decay automatically of the truncated two-point two correlation function. Okay. Um, and and we, can, we can talk about this more next time or in the office hours, um, but, but that's important to know that somehow the, uh, this Kotetsky price condition immediately gives this very strong probabilistic uh, consequence. Um, Another thing to work through, it would be this example, and actually I do want to mention this. I give an example. If uh, you have a, a graph G that doesn't have triangles, um, then if lambda is small enough, little o of n to the minus one fourth, you get an a asymptotic expression for the, the partition function. And the reason I want to, to mention this is the following, and I know, I know some people may be in the audience. Um, this, this is actually kind of similar to Janssen's inequality. Uh, it looks like Janssen's inequality because zg over 1 plus lambda to the n is a probability. It's exactly the probability you obtain an independent set when you pick a random subset of vertices uh, um, independently. And then this, this cluster expansion uh, formula for uh, the partition function, actually you could obtain it uh, by the methods of this nice paper um, by Musat and over Panagio 2 and Samoti. Um, which, uh, and this, this I leave as an open question, this paper seems very similar to some sort of uh, hypergraph cluster expansion. And I would, I would be interested to know, can you interpret their theorem uh, as a cluster expansion? And can you maybe get uh, different types of error bounds if you do interpret it as a cluster expansion? Um, and then I, I work through actually, how do you take the cluster expansion here? Um, okay, but to conclude, uh, and we'll get to we'll we'll go over this uh, stuff next time as well. Um, but the cluster expansion is this uh, infinite series representation for log z. In statistical physics, it's used to prove absence of phase transition, um, and it's been used in combinatorics uh, in combination in uh, relation to the low loss local lemma. But we can also use it to enumerate because it is an infinite series representation of log z. We can truncate it. Um, and while a statistical physicist is perfectly happy with an infinite series representation of some quantity, while in combinatorics we usually want to actually get an explicit formula, but sometimes maybe you need two or three terms for your explicit formula, and the cluster expansion we'll see is a way to see what those terms are. Um, and finally, I would like to just give you the idea that if you have a convergent cluster expansion, Morally, you should think of this as a nice generalization of a collection of independent random variables. And so in combinatorics, we often try to extend independence in other ways, like maybe martingales or something. 
but convergent cluster expansion is a very general notion of what uh, a nice generalization of n dependence is because you have all these nice properties you can control moment generating function you can control correlations uh, and so on okay so that that's that's it for today uh, we'll we'll go over this more next time uh, and then go to low temperatures as well great great lecture will thanks a lot um, and let, let me let me also put this link in so as soon as we're yeah. done here um, I'll, I'll be available if anyone wants to ask more detailed questions uh, I'll be here on zoom for office hours Well, if no, if not, so uh, may I ask a I question now? Question. Okay. Yeah, yeah, either of you. Go, go on, go uh, on, Leanna. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I didn't I understand your question about the paper of Vortec and uh, Frank and others. Oh, Sorry. okay. Yeah. I mean, uh, I would love for Wojtek also to shout something. But um, if you look at their paper, they uh, their result is this great. Uh, series for the log of some probability, mm -hmm. which is exactly what the cluster expansion is as well, once you normalize. It's the, you can interpret it as a series representation for a log of a large deviation probability. Um, and, and the terms they come up with are, are clusters, uh, and they're related to cumulants, and they're connected objects, um, but they derive it in a different way. And so what I'm wondering is, can you interpret it really as a cluster expansion and can you use some of the tools maybe from statistical physics to get different control on the error bounds? I see. I don't know, Wojtek, do you have any comment? Um, I would say that uh, the way we arrived at this result, uh, sorry, is that um, we had the method to derive more and more precise estimates on this probability, but we couldn't make any sense of the coefficients. And then Frank uh, went to some lecture and he saw this notion of joint cumulants. And so they were computed for, I think, triangles or something in, in, in GNP. And then he just so made the connection. And once we had the conjecture, we could prove it, uh, just so sort of generalizing this Bopana Spencer proof of Janssen's inequality. Uh, and after talking to you know, Bervolfo, I know there's some connection to, uh, to cluster expansion, but I I still haven't been able to. Uh, so, if, uh, Frank and Costa Panagotto discussed it. We discussed it a bit, but uh, so far it's still inconclusive. But uh, there is some, I'm sure there is some relation there. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I'm the same. I, I don't actually know the connection myself yet, but I know there must be. Um, because also, like, there's a way to talk about the Earth cell function as joint cumulants. So, if you look up Earth cell function on Wikipedia, it comes up with joint cumulants. And so these things are somehow exactly related. You guys are doing some hypergraph thing. Um, and so, so there's a little difference there. But, uh, but for example, the series I put in these lecture notes is exactly the series that you would get from your result. Um, so somehow it's, it's quite connected somehow. But you could do or this URSA function for, I guess, hypergraphs as well, right? I mean, isn't it, it's not defined? No, you, you can. I mean, there, it's, it's just whatever combinatorics result from the, the Taylor series, basically. But the, you can define the Ursel function as um, joint cumulants of something. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah I just wanted to cl clarify that the same things work for hypergraphs as well. So you have the same cluster expansion? If you, you can certainly do a cluster expansion. It, it hasn't been really studied that much, and convergence criteria are not nearly as clean. And so usually people like, I mean, in statistical physics, this would be called like a um, cluster expansion with a system with multi-body interactions. That's their name for hypergraphs. Um, but there's not some like clean condition yet, at least like the Katetsky price or the Shearer condition. Uh, but it's a, it's a great thing to pursue, I think. Uh, 
just a small organizational question. Are you, are you, are you intending to start your office hours right after this meeting or? or yeah, so as soon as I log off this, I'll just log on there. I mean, we could uh, say like, I see. we can say 11.15 if you like, but, uh, or whatever 15 it is for you. Uh, okay, thanks. Can I ask a quick question about chapter two? So it's not about clusters. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, it's a follow up of my, well, my question is about theorem 2.8 in which uh, the, the bipartite graph KDD maximized, uh, realizes the, the maximizing Y, right? Yeah. Is it generally expected that many problems like this you find a maximizing y, and then it's going to be realized by some graph, or it's just a good co coincidence. It's just a good coincidence. So in the minimization problem, for instance, the mm -hmm. minimizer is not realized. Oh, I see. Because the minimizer is constant, and um, and you can't have it can't be constant in a graph. But I mean, it's even worse than that. It's much worse than that. I showed you this plot of how the lower bound goes, and it mm -hmm. drops down. Mm -hmm. And in any graph, this function has to be monotone. So, uh, so it, it really is not realized in a strong way. Then what, what was the workaround? Well, the, the, the workaround there was like, it, it was good enough. Uh, the bound you get was good enough if you take lambda small. And we were able to prove something about the occupancy fraction up to lambda being one, say. But really, we would have liked to prove a lower bound all the way um, for much larger lambda to try to get this factor two from Shearer's result. Hmm. Any other questions? Okay, very good. So if anyone wants to join for office hours, please do. Otherwise, I'll see you guys Friday. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Will. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Will.